So hello and welcome to Science Never Stops. I'm your host, Joseph Vick, the Museum Education Director with the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. Today we are celebrating NASA's International Observe the Moon Night, sponsored by Planetary Missions Program at Marshall Space Flight Center. International Observe the Moon Night is a time to come together with fellow moon enthusiasts and curious people worldwide. Everyone on Earth is invited to learn about lunar science and exploration, take part in celestial observations, and honor cultural and personal connections to the moon. You can check out moon.nasa.gov forward slash observe online and follow the hashtag observe the moon on your preferred social media platform. Outdoors, at home, or online, or wherever you may be, we're glad to have you with us tonight. However you choose to observe, please follow local guidelines on health and safety. On today's program, we have Professor Billy Hicks with Teach STEM LLC, a company he created to be able to do STEM outreach to schools across Tennessee. Professor Billy Hicks is a solar system ambassador and science communicator, has had careers at both Marshall Space Flight Center and in higher education. In the fifth grade, he said to himself that when he grew up, he would visit schools and tell them how cool the night sky and space program is. He also told his classmates that he would work mission control for a man landing on Mars. He taught future science teachers for the last couple of decades of his career, and he has received many honors and awards. But one of his proudest was being selected as Science Teacher of the Year in the great state of Tennessee. He took early retirement in 2015, and with his portable planetarium, he visits approximately 100 schools each year leading astronomy parties for rural schools across Tennessee. A little over 72,000 students and teachers have been inspired while learning inside his portable planetarium. Welcome, Professor Billy Hicks to Science Never Stops. Oh, thank you, Joseph. And, and, and if you look behind me, where you, you said anywhere, that uh, you happen to be located, you can participate in. I am in my own private observatory this evening. Um, I am kind of isolated. I'm a little, you know, I'm an hour and a half away from Huntsville. I'm an hour and 45 minutes from Nashville. And I always wanted telescopes. So I have my own observatory in a field next to my house and your listeners might be able to hear all the crickets and cicadia that are outside the door this afternoon well, I, so i assume for an astronomer being out in an, an area that's not filled with light pollution is a dream oh it is um just now it, 25 years ago when i built my house here it was really dark but the world has slowly encroached around me. And so, um, you know, it's about time for me to move again to on, on search for dark skies. But uh, but this is my happy place. If I can be tired, I can be blue and I can come here. The roof rolls off. I fire up the telescopes and and Christmas was a little tough at my house because I grew up in rural poverty. And I'll tell you a secret that very few people know. I play Christmas music all year long in my <laughs> observatory because every evening I spend here is as close to Christmas as I can be. And so I play Christmas enjoy. music and look at the stars and sometimes look at the moon. So, well, there you go. So speaking of the moon, so our first question with today being International Observe the Moon Night and our celebration here, what is your first memory of observing the moon and the impact it had on you? Well, the, 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 first, uh, the first episode of remembering of viewing the moon 
impacted my life so deeply, Joseph, that the rest of my life was changed because of it. Now, obviously, I am old, and I was in the fifth grade back in 1968, and and I grew up in a place that doesn't even exist anymore. It was a very rural community, very small school. My my classroom only had seven students, counting me, in my grade. There were four girls and three boys, and nobody ever came to my school. Nobody ever left. I started out with seven in the eighth grade. I had the same old seven. Um, And in science, NASA, going to space, none of that was celebrated. Actually, it was frowned upon. But I was certainly a closeted scientist. And and in my little farmhouse, I had pictures that I cut out of Life magazine of every astronaut. And I pretended to be in mission control. Um, And on Christmas Eve, 1968, when the rest of my family and extended family all got together, it was like the Waltons TV show. Uh, Everybody was together, they were eating. I wandered off to a small room that had a little black and white TV and I sat on a cold floor. I remember it being cold and I literally watched craters pass by the screen because that was Apollo 8 um, with uh, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders. Um, And later on that evening, they read from the book of Genesis as the moon passed by. It was the greatest experience that I ever had. And and the adults would kind of check in on me every now and then. It's like, hey, don't you want to come and be with the rest of us? And it was like, no, no, no. And I'm sure they thought, oh, poor nerd. You know, Billy's just a nerd and he doesn't want to associate with us. But I remember that so well because I was just amazed at the clarity of the craters. Now I look back at the video clips now and think, wow, video quality was really poor. But in 1968, it was awesome. Um, And then just about seven months later, I was, it was July and I certainly remember the moon landing, but I will tell you, that probably more impactful in many ways was watching the moon up close and thinking, if we can do this, we can do anything. And and although in my little community, I was often told, you know, young men need to be a farmer and young ladies need to be farmers' wives. And that was the goal of our education system was to produce good farmers. And, and actually, I was disciplined in the fifth grade on career day when I told my teachers or my teacher that I was going to leave this community and go work for NASA because I thought, sure, we'd be on Mars by the time I was in college, which in the long run was the greatest thing that ever happened to me because it broke my heart. It made me mad. I went home. I told my mom that I was never going back to school, and I learned so many life lessons. My parents were really poor. They were not very educated, but they were loving, kind, hardworking people. My mom said, most of life will never be fair, but you have to go back and show them what you're made out of. And that's when I promised to her that someday when I grew up, course i thought maybe a lot of schools were like mine i mean i certainly now know that was a rarity but uh i said i will visit schools and tell them how cool it is to know cool stuff um the best part of apollo 11 my parents had gone to bed and so you feel really big when you're you know about 12 13 and nobody's up and so i'm watching the same little black and white tv and i'm watching neil and buzz just kind of bounce along and I thought, I think I'll go outside. And so I, I went outside, of course, you're by yourself. 
I lived in a great dark sky place because there were just nothing around us. And, uh, and I can still remember straight up, this was about 11 o'clock in the evening. I mean, almost at the zenith was the bright red dot of Mars. And Jupiter was setting low in the western sky. And there was a slightly gibbous moon. And I can still, I can close my eyes and, and feel the night air. I can see that image. It changed my life so deeply. But as impactful as Apollo 11 was, and I thought, wow, there are two people up there on the moon and they're just bouncing around. I will still tell you that Apollo 8, as far as the wow factor, was greater to me than even Apollo 11. But both of those were really burned in my mind. You know, I've looked at the moon many a time. I was with a best friend once um, that, um, and this would have been in the last 15 or 20 years, um, we were doing a program um, for teachers. And, and this was, we were doing uh, teacher support and, uh, and I had a, 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 a dear friend with me and we were going across the Tennessee River and the moon was about one day old and it was the thinnest sliver and you know in all those moments they were really wow moments i, I had to pull off the road you know we just had to take it in for a moment uh, and so the moon's always been a companion of mine but uh, the impactful moments had to be certainly december of 68 and july of 69. Well, you had made mention with the impact the craters had on you with the Apollo 8 mission, seeing those on that small black and white television. And speaking of craters, are you excited about NASA's future efforts of landing astronauts again on the lunar surface to explore oh, yes. the South Polar region, especially in Shackleton Crater, which is going to be that landing site? Oh, yes. Uh, I had a relative take me to see the movie 2001 a space odyssey now i came about this close to having a heart failure in the movie itself now it was so far above my head still is parts of it above my head but the the scenery of flying through space docking with a space station of uh, I was just about to have heart failure. I thought, oh, this is the future. Not far in the future. I will see it. I will participate in it. Um, and they lived, or they had a base in Clavius. And um, Clavius is a little south of where NASA's looking at landing. Um, the Shackleton Crater is almost next to Clavius. And so uh, when, when possible, and when I'm looking at the moon, particularly in this white telescope that's right behind me, because it, it has such a sharp focus that you can really enjoy. It looks like you're just flying in an airplane across the moon. I often fly down to Clavius and think, oh, yes, I remember you know, watching 2001 and they had a base there. So I would like to let the NASA people know that when they land in Shackleton, I would love for them to get in a rover and head south. They don't have to go far and plant a flag over in Clavius and also look for a really black uh, monolithic structure just to make sure that, you know, the movie was really fictional. Um, so I am really excited. Uh, and I, when I talk to young people, science was self-evident in my generation when I was young. Science was everywhere. Um, people, people believed scientists. Um, even where I grew up and science was often hated, they believed it. Young people need to, the chance to see us aiming high going for big goals. And so when I do my planetarium programs, I always close with a lesson on the moon. And, and we talk about in the South Pole and the North Pole that um, 
these are the places that would really be interesting for reasons we'll get into in a minute. And um, and so I get right excited because I tell the students, most of them have no clue that we're even trying to go. You know, and I go, wouldn't it be neat to be part of a team that builds the craft, directs the craft, or maybe even one of the people who land on the moon? And um, so, so I primarily visit rural schools, and um, and seventy two thousand is you know a, a very very close approximation. It's probably a little more than that. Um, and I don't, you know, I'm sure some people go in and they go out. Um, I really target the students, but I work really hard to excite the teachers because unfortunately a lot of them are pretty clueless about our efforts to go back to the moon. So you are, from what I take, a very good science communicator passing along the knowledge for the next generation. And you have that solid background of experience of looking up at the moon and it inspiring you. So you're passing on that inspiration. Now, a little bit of that, and speaking of goals, that goals for anybody, teachers, scientists, anybody aspiring for great things is very important for us to know and pass along. Now, for here's a little fun fact. Uh, what is what is your favorite moon fact you'd like to share with the audience? Oh, I, I get so excited when I'm working with young people because and I don't want to hit the old thing too much, but you know, if you if you step into the gym, because that's where my plan, portable planetarium fits. It's it's 30 feet across and 15 feet tall. It looks like a big blue igloo. It's got a door on it and takes about an hour or so to set up by an hour takedown. And um, and so I go outside and I meet the students and then we go inside. And I'm sure that if I were in the fifth grade and I looked at me today, it'd be like, wow, they raided the nursing home and brought somebody here. Um, but I cannot tell you how many times I've had that cool moment toward the end and students don't mean it in a bad way. Like, wow, you look old, but you are so exciting. And I said, that's the reason why I wanted to be here today. You make me feel good. Um, when I'm working with young people, I always ask this question. Hey, guys, is there water on the moon? And 99% of the time, maybe not 100, but 99%, oh, the moon is dry. Oh, no water. You know, oh. And, and I just let them, I just kind of nod long because that encourages more people to jump in. Oh, yes, you're right. No water on the moon. And then I'll raise my hands and I go, that was an excellent answer. The only problem with it is that you're wrong. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they, <gasps> they gasp, you know, and I said, no, you're, you know, because starting in 1976 on a Russian return sample, we saw so possible evidence that there was moisture on the moon. And with the way science works is we look for more evidence and we build that evidence over time. And uh, by 2009, we certainly had some real definitive answers and the Elcross mission crashed into a pole and I don't remember if it was north or south, and kicked up a bunch of debris, and we examined the spectrograph of that debris that get kicked up, uh, kicked up, and we were able to see quite a bit of evidence of water. So we know that there's water on the poles, um, and of course, any place, I always ask kids, what well, guys, what do you think you could do with water? And they always say something like, oh, we could drink it. And I said, oh, but we can do something much cooler than drink it. And it's like, what, what, what? And I said, if we split our water, it takes a lot of energy, but if we split our water into its hydrogen and oxygen components, now we have rocket fuel. 
so we've got something to drink and we were making rocket fuel and so that means that you might not have to carry all the fuel with you you can make your own so a lot of possibilities you know and and usually the teachers will say something like was well, there a little bit of ice and i go no there's a lot of ice you know there's still some debate on how all the ice ended up there you know was it comet impacts you know or what but um, but lots of ice and students i will hear them out in the hallways at the end of the day going moon's got water and i said yes never forget it well that's an excellent example of you being a science communicator passing along knowledge to the next generation but as a science educator and science communicator what advice would you give what solid advice would you give to the next generation of students that want to grow up to be nasa scientists engineers other science educators and communicators oh joseph what a great question and thank you for asking because uh, of all the things that i could talk to young people about if i if i and other educators fail at preparing the next generation to be successful it doesn't make any difference if our classroom was fun or not or the prettiest or the coolest or had the coolest stem activities if we're not preparing the next generation to take over and they're going to face some big problems these young people are going to be challenged and they've got to have good critical thinking skills and that's going to come from their educational background but i often have kids talk about oh i want to you know do what you do or i want to work at nasa or or you know i want to be an astronaut or whatever and i tell them i said here's what it takes to really be successful you got to have passion i mean you got to want something bad and 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 i will tell you that i'm sure when i worked at marshall and and i was there for an entire year the very first time i worked i was always on loan from the college they had a program where they could bring on people and um and so it was for a year i worked on a project uh and along with passion you got to have the abilities to get along with people and be a team player and that's the reason why i'm always big on kids um, playing a sport or an activity or being not just a member of a club but try to be a leadership position because you got to work with people i've never met anybody that got to sit in a cubicle and never interact with people um but anyway uh, passion, working well with people, um, and and then you got to want something pretty bad, and and so you do need to study. Uh, nobody, I don't care how smart you are, and I don't care if you're not all that smart. If you want something bad enough and willing to work for it, you can be successful. I can tell you and your listeners that my school did not prepare me well for the future. Now, my future. Now, if I were going to work on a farm, they prepared me extremely well. Uh, I stayed at my little rural school through the eighth grade, and then I transferred to a high school in a slightly larger community. And because we were quite poor, and I had come from this community, it was just automatically assumed that, oh, you're going to be in agriculture or a factory worker. When I went to see the high school guidance counselor, and I was probably a junior in high school, so it was probably my third year. I remember telling the high school guidance counselor, I wanted to find out how you got scholarships. I wanted to go to college. And I remember this gentleman, he was a man, he said, Billy, it cost a lot of money. And at that time, there were many new factories in my area. And he said, you can get an excellent factory and have health insurance and the whole bit. And so K 
through 12 education was a fight for me. I was certainly not the smartest person. When I finally made it to Tennessee Tech, where I went to graduate school, it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. All of a sudden, I realized for the first time in my whole life, you're, it didn't make any difference whether you're rich or poor. It only mattered how smart you were and how hard you're willing to work. I knew I wasn't the smartest person in the room, but I was not going to be outworked. Um, and so maybe that's the reason I lost all my hair. I don't know. But um, the uh, you got to want something kind of bad. Um, I always tell kids, I said, do you really want it? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I said, do you really want it bad? Because that's how bad you've got to want it. Um, you will not be the smartest person in the room. You don't want to be the smartest person in the room. Every day I went to NASA, and I know you've been down this road, but as you go down right out road, you're you're driving into Marshall, and there's a big sign, like an interstate sign, and, and one is for like Redstone Arsenal or something like that, but it says NASA, Marshall Space Flight Center, big green sign, it's got an arrow points to the right lane. I always touch my heart because I couldn't believe that I really made it. For 11 years, I touched my heart. Every time I went under this, I had to make sure I was really alive and I was awake. And so you got to want something bad. You got to want to share it with others because nobody is an island. Nobody lives in isolation. So, so you got to be a team player. You got to be willing to work and you got to have passion for your subject. I am as old as the hills, but talking to you, I just get so fired up and get so excited that I keep thinking about maybe one person, young person is still listening to me right now. And I'm telling you that I am proof that if you want to do something bad enough, you can do it. All you got to do is work at it and not quit when it's hard. I agree. Passion is key to reach for the stars. So thank you very much, Professor Billy Hicks, for joining us in our celebration of the International Observe the Moon Night. I've also wanted to make sure a big thank you. Thank you again for our sponsor, the Planetary Missions Program at Marshall Space Flight Center. Please, we both encourage you to go out and observe the moon, as well as go online to see other exciting virtual moon celebrations around the world at moon.nasa.gov forward slash observe and wanted to wish all of you clear skies and remember that science never stops. Thank you again. Billy. Oh, thank you.